welcome back to 20 CS TV. I'm Justine Marshner here, and we have a special guest joining with us today. Nate Barrington, an outdoor recreation major here at SUNY Cortland, and an avid climber made remarkable news with his story saving a Doberman pitcher at the Clark State Reservation Park near Syracuse, New York. Welcome, Nate. Thank you. So, to begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, I, like you said, I'm an outdoor recreation major, and I I've been going to SUNY Cortland now, I think this is my third semester. Um, I'm the student manager of the new rock climbing gym at the SLC. And uh, I am a pretty busy guy at the moment. All right, so how did you become so interested in climbing? In the article on SUNY Cortland's website, it says that as a kid, you were always climbing trees and buildings, and then moved on to mountains and caves. So what sparked this interest? Um, you know, something we do when we teach uh, climbing at the center is that we tell people they, everybody has innate climbing ability. Um, and I think I just found that at a really young age. Uh, it just really spoke to me, not to sound too dorky, but it was something that was always uh, a lot of fun. And uh, I also like giving my parents uh, a little run for their money and make their hearts flutter a little bit. So there might have been some of that too. Yeah. <laughs> So how long have you been climbing for and what type of climbing do you do? Uh, well, I started off on trees uh, and then moved to the house. And then um, when I got a little bit older and I was allowed to actually go out on my own, I would climb buildings. Uh, wow. Um, so, so then, um, according to the article, it says that you're currently the student manager of the 42-foot tall climbing wall in SUNY Cortland's new Student Life Center. So how did you acquire this position? Uh, I had thought about applying a long time ago, but then I wasn't really sure what the deal was with the wall. I actually managed to get myself into the SLC when they were almost done building the wall. And once I saw that it was actually a company um, that does this professionally, it's in Micros, our wall is from, uh, I looked and I called up one of the uh, graduate assistants who was in charge of hiring, and I told her like, hey, I know I'm really late, but uh, I'll volunteer. Uh, this, this place is amazing. I had no idea you were putting in something like this. Um, so instead, she convinced me to interview, and I did. And then uh, about maybe a week or two into it, um, they had asked me if I wanted to step up to become the student manager because they had noticed that I have a, a background and experience with this stuff. Oh, wow. So. Awesome. Yeah. So then um, the article states that rescue crews were getting desperate on this cold night after five hours of helplessly peering down a foot-wide rock crevice at the barely visible back of a dog wedged head first far below. So how do they get in contact with you to help out in this situation? That's a good question. Um, there's an emergency vet clinic in Syracuse and a friend of mine works there. Her name's Melissa. So around 11, 11, 15, I was working on my car and I get a Facebook message and a text message from her uh, really briefly saying that there's a dog stuck in a crevice at Clark's and the first responders are asking for any help they can get because they can't get her out. So I called her and asked what was going on and she gave me a little bit more information. Uh, she didn't have too much. And then I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come out. I'm not really sure what I'm getting into, but uh, that's how I found out. And in fact, I used to actually work at that emergency clinic like 10 years ago or so. Awesome. So then um, when you first got the call, what was going through your mind at the time? Uh, well, it certainly sounded more interesting and more fun than working on a car. Um, I was just trying to figure out what I would need gear-wise. I um, mean, I have some of my own gear, but this was more of a caving type of thing than it would be climbing. And you still use ropes and harnesses, but they're different ropes and different harnesses. Uh, and I don't actually have my own. So I tried to get into the outing clubs. Uh, we have an equipment room up at SU. But it was late, there was really nobody around, um, and they had just been uh, on spring break, and a lot of our gear was out because of that. So I wasn't able to rouse anybody for that, and I decided, like, well, I'm just going to take what I have and head up there anyway. So then that was, gets back into my next question. Um, so when you arrived at this scene, the article says you were agreed there by a snowmobile and taken to the site. At this time, what were you expecting? Uh, when we got to the site? Yeah. I wasn't, I mean, I'm familiar with that whole state park. I've been going there since I was a kid. I'm a Syracuse native. Um, so I knew, you know, what it looked like. Um, I hadn't gone to that area in the snow in several years, but um, I also was not, not usually around that area in the dark. Uh, so I was trying to just get my bearings about me. I mean, I had 
you know, a rope, I had a harness already on, I had actually this coat on, uh, waterproof pants. Um, I was pretty geared up. The only thing I didn't have was a helmet, but I can tell anybody. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wasn't really sure what to expect. I didn't know what kind of dog it was at that point. Um, I didn't know what the situation was, how she was wedged in there. I was given um, a very brief rundown from the park police before I went in. And basically what I got is that they were not really expecting me to be able to do much at all. They weren't really hopeful. Oh, wow. So, so when you arrived, did you have any idea how the Stoberman Pinscher got stuck in such a small crevice? Um, they did say that she had just, um, I think, had been let off leash to play with another dog um, by her owners, and she bolted, maybe saw another animal or something, and took off, and I think it was probably covered by snow, and she just walked over it and then fell down into it. Uh, it's a limestone park, mm -hmm. so there's just all these cracks in the limestone all throughout the park where you, sometimes you can't see them. Oh, wow. Um, it's a pretty cool spot, but it can be dangerous if you're not careful. <laughs> so, when you first saw the female dog, how did she appear to be? The article states that she was showing few signs of life as the freezing rain was getting colder. Yeah, I, um, she didn't look good. Um, I didn't know if she was still breathing. She didn't seem to be moving. I mean, she was certainly pinned, you know, there was, um, you couldn't see her legs. I can only see, like, maybe this much of her back. Um, and it took me about 30 seconds with a halogen light directly on her to even like make out her form finally. Uh, there had been tons of snow and ice and mud that had come down on top of her back. Mm -hmm. So it just made it really difficult to see all that. Yeah. Um, and finally they kept on pointing and trying to get closer so they could actually make out what they were talking about. And so I had just rigged up my rope to a tree, uh, anchored in, put my uh, belay device on my harness and started to descend in after I had a brief chat about what I was going to do. I mean, I, they asked me what my plan was, and I just said, oh, I'm going to go in there. Um, and the articles that were printed in Syracuse kept on focusing. I mean, climbers are usually we're pretty thin people, typically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I was thin enough to actually start to squeeze my way into the, the crack. OK, so then um, as you were climbing down, what was going through your mind at this point? Um, I wasn't really sure what my plan was, except just to try to get my body as close to her as possible. And get, uh, they had a bunch of catch poles, mm -hmm. and that was the goal, was to get one of those around her so we could start to hoist her up with that. Wow. So then, um, what did you end up actually doing to get down to this 20-foot crevice to save the dog? Uh, well, I had gone in with the rope uh, twice, I believe, and the second time in, um, it was pretty frustrating the first time. The second time was even worse and I realized that it wasn't really doing anything safety-wise. So I took all that stuff off, um, unhooked the rope and took the harness off uh, and realized if I were to go in and slip, I mean, I'm not gonna move anywhere. It's so tight up against me. I mean, I couldn't even like move my head side to side. I had to position myself to do that even. Um, so third time in, I kept on, you know, if this is the crack right here and the trees here, I kept on going in like my back coming in this way and heading down. Um, and I would try for 20 minutes or more to try to get the uh, catch pole around her, but I was working blind. I could only see her back end still. Uh, there was this really big rock that was kind of lodged in between the major rock formations in the way of getting a direct line of sight on her. So there was no way to get around that. Uh, so I either had to go above it or below it, and every time I did, the angle was just terrible to maneuver anything. So then how did you get around it eventually? Uh, eventually, you know, after I came up and tried to regroup again, I turned around and went in a different, just facing a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that time I was able to find a bit of an opening in the, uh, the crack to get down and around. And then finally, when I did that, I was actually able to see ahead. Wow. Um, and as time went on, I mean, she was making less and less noise. Every so often, she let out a whimper, and it was the saddest thing on earth. Um, but then when I got that around her, she started to fight me a little bit, which, I mean, I'm sure it sucked, and I would have fought me too, but <laughs> it was a good sign in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, so then it was a matter of getting the catch pole. The catch pole I had to use was a four-foot catch pole, and I'm down like 15 feet. So they had to bring another catch pole down over that catch pole, wrap around the handle of that one and then start to pull up with that. Uh, so that was another 10 minute process. Um, and then when she started to come free, 
I had to get another one around her legs to provide some more support because this was around her neck basically. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we didn't want to cut off too much uh, air. And then as she was getting lifted out, I was trying to like help guide her up. Uh, I thought she died. Uh, she went slack at one point and I thought that, that was it, that we were going to be giving them the body of their dog, at least for some closure, but that she just died in that moment. Uh, and they brought her out and I'm still down on the crack and uh, they whisk her away on the snowmobile and uh, I finally make my way out and uh, there's only two guys left and I had no idea what was happening. So, so then what was going through your mind at that point? I was just asking them if they knew anything and they just said like, well, she was breathing, you know, when she got out, but that's all they knew. Um, so I packed up my gear, I made my way back up the hill and got onto the snowmobile. They took me back to the parking lot. Um, I talked to the park police guy for a moment and then I got in the car and drove to the vet clinic. And what time in the morning was this? Uh, that was about 2 a.m. And what made you want to go back to the veterinary clinic instead of back home? I would not have been able to sleep. I mean, I was high in adrenaline and I just wanted to know how she was doing, mm -hmm. so. So then when you got to the veterinary clinic, what happened? Um, you know, at this point I didn't really know anybody that uh, still worked there except the doctor on duty. Actually, it was an employee there when I was there uh, years ago. So they let me come into the back and I met the um, boyfriend owner of the dog. Um, the other woman's, I didn't get his name, but the other woman's name is Kiana, uh, Kiana Rose, I believe. But uh, he shook my hand and then Remy was being warmed up. She came in at 94 degrees body temperature um, and dogs were a little bit hotter than humans. So that was pretty low and she was definitely in shock, but uh, she was starting to make some noise and come back to life a little bit. And then how are the owners reacting towards you? Um, you know, the uh, Kiana added me on Facebook the next day and expressed a lot of gratitude, of course. Um, I think the guy, you know, was pretty late at night. He was pretty much in shock. Mm -hmm. I don't think he knew what to think. Uh, pretty, he looked pretty tired, so. But yeah, they've, they've been great. Um, you know, and I'm really glad the next day she went home. It's awesome. Yeah. Such an awesome story. So having so much attention on such a remarkable story, have students or faculty on the SUNY Cortland campus thanked you or approached you with anything recently? Yeah, several of them have. It's been really nice. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that this got so much attention. Uh, initially, the paper put up the story and they didn't have my name. And they just mentioned SUNY Cortland and Rock Climber. And then a couple days later, um, they were trying to figure out who I was, and I had a bunch of calls from my advisor and my professor, and then Jay called me, uh, all asking me if I had saved a dog the other night, and I was just like, how, how do you know that, <laughs> what? Um, so I had agreed to uh, an interview with the Post Standard, and yeah, it just kind of exploded. Uh, yeah, so. well such a great story goes viral like that. Yeah, yeah, it's been cool. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for taking time out of your day to come and sit with us My and pleasure. answer these questions. Thank you. It's been You're fun. welcome. So thank you so much again, Nate, for joining us here today. Your story is a true inspiration, a reminder that there are good people out there in this world. I hope Nate's story leaves a lasting impression on you all and brightens up your week. Thank you again, and I'm Justine Marshner here at 20CS TV.